Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. forever. Amen. Jesus said, the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh God, because without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, and then Kelly, if you're talking, uh, you, you have to unmute yourself there. Hey, uh, Kelly, can you unmute yourself? Oh, well, okay. All right, if you don't mind starting over at the beginning of Exodus. Thank you, Kelly. A reading from the book of Exodus. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. 
and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. All those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. 
So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, or who, you, you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seal of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to, to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Peter came and said to Jesus, 
Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord, all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father, will also do to every one of you. If you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Lord Christ. Christ. Preach in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, wow. So, interesting back to back gospel lessons. So I'm not sure if you were able to join us last week, but Jesus actually gave us like some pretty down to earth advice on what to do if someone wrongs you. And then so, and I'm sure you've heard this before. So first you go to them privately, give them an an opportunity to admit their fault and you can forgive them. But if they don't listen to you, take one or two other people from the church and go and confront them. And if they still don't listen to you, bring it in front of the entire church. And if they still don't uh, listen to you and admit their fault, then they're an outcast. They're like a Gentile and a tax collector and all those other bad things. But here, this week, not only are we supposed to keep on forgiving, we're supposed to do it 77 times. And if we don't forgive out of our hearts, then we are like that greedy, greedy slave who begged for mercy and received it, but would not give it in turn. And then unlike last week, Jesus is making a clear tie between our behavior here on earth and what the kingdom of God and God's mercy is like. And the lesson is clear. You have already received mercy that you don't deserve. And so you are supposed to show mercy in turn by forgiving your neighbor. And then these two lessons seem to be in conflict. But for me, I actually see them as being in perfect harmony. Because forgiving is hard. And admitting that you're wrong is hard. What the first slave, or what the slave did initially that granted his forgiveness was admitting his fault. He asked for mercy and he received it. And then the second slave asked for mercy, and he would not give it to him. So his hypocrisy was shown. But the individual, the hypothetical individual that wronged us, that we brought two friends to, and then the entire congregation, they refused to admit their faults. And forgiveness could not happen. But let's say after that person has become an outcast, and then you rid them from your life, maybe a week, a month, or a year has passed, 
and they say, you know what, I was wrong. Or even, hey, I just want to have a relationship with you. Maybe we'll never see eye to eye on this issue, but I love you and I want to be in your life. Then what we are supposed to do is clear. We are supposed to forgive. And forgiveness and retaining debts and forgiving debts, it's something we talk about a lot. And I think a lot of people say that we forgive others when we truly do not mean it. Forgiving a spouse that has truly done something horrendous, has betrayed the trust of the relationship, to say that you forgive them because you would prefer not to get divorced because you have to keep on living together, but you still hold that pain in your heart. That's not forgiveness. That's just choosing to continue to live side by side with someone who has wronged you deeply. Forgiveness is a lot harder and it requires a lot more honesty. And it's something that we have to learn how to do as adults. And I think part of being a teenager is just screwing up a lot. And I think I was particularly good at this when I was 16, 17 years old. Um, And out of all of those terrible, hurtful things I did, um, and all of the hurtful things that were done to me, um, I got really good at admitting my fault and saying I was sorry. And I would learn from my mistakes. And then that's what we do as children, we're expected to to mess up. And then the forgiveness comes almost immediately. But when you become a teenager, all of a sudden you start to be, uh, you need to be held to a higher standard. And yeah, if you say that hurtful thing once and you ask for forgiveness and you go and do it again, you're not going to get the same forgiveness that you got when you were seven years old. That trust can be permanently damaged. And I remember two or three very specific occasions where I messed up when I was 16, 17, 19 years old. And I realized I messed up. And then I bit my tongue and I went and asked for forgiveness. And I expected to receive it. And I didn't. And those relationships were severed. And I still carry that pain today. I feel terrible for it. And I remember that first time it happened, the shock of someone saying, no, I don't accept your apology. I see that you're sincere, but we're done. That has real power. And then what we are called to do is to recognize the power of holding a grudge can have, not only on ourselves, but on the people we hold the grudge against. And then for me, the lesson I received from those moments was actually quite profound and honest, that my actions have real consequences, that what I can do can permanently damage a relationship with someone else. And most importantly, it made me realize that saying you're forgiven should not be empty words. What's worse then being not forgiven is to have someone say they forgive you, but to still hold that pain, to withhold honesty, just because they want, it's easier to keep on living with you than it is to be honest and have those hard conversations. What Christ is urging us to do is so unbelievably difficult. To really forgive someone You have to make sure that they know that they hurt you. And to ask for forgiveness, there's so many shallow apologies out there in the world where people give excuses rather than admit their fault and they expect to be forgiven. When you hurt someone and you go to apologize and you don't admit that you were wrong in doing it, it's not an apology at all. What Jesus has been telling us these last two weeks is so unbelievably simple, but so unbelievably difficult to do. And forgiveness is not something that's on the surface. Despite this threat, you don't want to be like the slave that receives forgiveness, but won't give it in turn. 
But at the same time, if we say we forgive, but we don't do the hard work of communicating, of praying, of digging deep down into our souls to recognize our own hurt, then it's not forgiveness at all. Forgiveness is not something we throw out to make sure we check off that box in being a good Christian. Forgiveness is not something we throw out just to maintain the status quo with the people we choose to live with. Forgiveness is instead a lifestyle. As human beings, we are not so different as teenagers. We are made to mess up. We may not mess up with the same frequency, but we still mess up. And people around us still mess up and hurt us. This is something that is human. And if we don't embrace a culture of forgiveness and grace, not only will will our hearts become so hard with all the grudges that we bear that it will be too much to keep on going, we will also not respect ourselves and others by saying we deserve an apology. You hurt me those hard conversations don't happen and the cycle of pain and hurt just spirals out of control. Christ constantly tells us that our behavior with each other is fundamentally tied in with our relationship with God. Practical advice on how to deal with people is fundamentally a spiritual exercise. And we should treat each other as the sacrament that we are. When someone hurts you, be honest with them. If they're able to admit their faults, try your best to forgive them. If you're not ready yet, be honest. And if they love you, they'll give you the time you need to work on that hard, hard task of prayer, of respect, and then ultimately, If we work hard enough, we can harvest that fruit of forgiveness so that we may not only receive it, but others may receive it as well. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds proceeds from the the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we we all all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there There may may be justice and peace on earth. 
Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our, that our works, works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That, that they, they may be delivered, delivered from their distress. distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let, Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May, May we, we also, also come, come to share in your heavenly kingdom. kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others, especially Lou, Julia, Scott, Marie, Pam, John, Hilda, Mike, Sarah, Jane, Larry, David, Pete, Rusty, Darlene, Sharon, Eula, Kathy, Ron, Kathy, Carolia, Pat, Catherine, Linda, Crystal, Tammy, Mallory, James, Rocky, Catherine, Mary Ruth, Melissa, Colette, Linda, Jimmy, Lewis, Linda Bender, Christine, Jimmy, Pat, Renee, and David Bullens. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us say it together. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
My friends, life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind and go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.